at least you're in this video we're going to take you through your field labor budget maybe your most important budget because it's what's going to help you manage your field labor which for most landscape companies is your biggest or at least your riskiest expense not only will we help you manage it and plan for a profitable amount of field labor we'll also benchmark what you're spending on field labor compared to companies who do a similar type of work as you that way you'll know whether you've got too much too little or just enough field labor to hit your sales goals. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But let's start with how to create it. Starting from our budget. We were up here in sales, if you were in our last video, just move down here to the field labor tab, and now we're on field labor. The very first field you're gonna see is something called labor burden. Labor burden can look a little bit tricky, but it's not that complicated. In here, I've got labor burden 20%. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we pay somebody a wage, let's say it's just a dollar, your cost is just a dollar. Because on top of that wage, you have to pay payroll tax, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, and maybe other of those type of taxes. That's what your labor burden is. In this case, I've used the labor, 20, uh, labor burden of 20% to say we need to add 20% to every dollar of our wages to cover for the taxes and workers' comp and the other expenses that go along with having employees. So how do you figure out what your labor burden is? Pretty simple formula. If you just for your entire company last year added up your payroll taxes, your workers comp and your unemployment, and you divided it by your raw wages, you'd figure out what percent those things are of your wages. And of course, that's the same percentage you need to add to your wages to recover those things. That's how that works. Just note for some companies, it might be more than what we're displaying here on the screen. If you have to pay vacation pay, that could be considered labor burden or you give uh, paid holidays or paid sick time as part of your compensation. Those are unbillable hours or expenses over and above uh, what the employees are actually gonna work, and you should include those in your labor burden as well. Once you've got your labor burden calculated and dialed in, next up's the overtime multiplier. And for most companies, that's time and a half, so it should be 1.5x, you're good to go. Now we can dive into the field staff really important here to figure out who goes in your field labor budget. First of all, it's not everybody. It's definitely not everybody. Your field labor budget should only contain the people who work in the field, or more accurately, the people whose time you estimate. Remember, there's only two ways to recover a cost when you're estimating. It's either in your estimate or it's part of your overhead markups. So in this case, or in the case of your company, you're going to have two types of people. You have people whose time you estimate. Those are typically your crews. Those are who's going to go in this labor budget. Then you have the people whose time you don't estimate. Your accountants, your bookkeepers, other roles like that. They're going to go in overhead, and that's how we're going to recover their wages. When you have your system dialed in, everybody's wages will get recovered because they're in the right places. So in here in your field labor budget, you only want to include the people whose time you estimate. So for instance, here I've got my foreman, my laborer, I've got equipment operators, people who work out in the field, and who, when I do an estimate, think about their hours when I come up with my price for the estimate. Now, I don't want to put all my people in individually either. That makes for a really long budget and also overcomplicates things. People are going to turn over middle of the year, part of the year. I might have four laborers in a given year, but it was really just one role. I just kept flipping one laborer over and over as we quit and got fired and did all those type of things. It's a lot easier to think about the number of people you're going to need at each position and then just budget for your position. Here you can see I've got install foreman. I've used an average wage for the calculations. I've said I've got two staff that are install foreman. They work each about 1,800 hours a year and about 200 overtime hours each. Their average wage for that position is $21 an hour and I haven't budgeted for a bonus here. So what that's gonna do is budget for $88,200 in wages for my foreman. Now that's for both of them, remember. Next up, I got install labor. I've got three laborers in my install department. They're gonna work 1,750 hours a year with about 150 hours of overtime at an average wage of about $15 an hour. And there's my budget for my laborers. Then I get into maintenance foreman. Now we split maintenance foreman and install foreman because the average wage is so different. Other things may be different too, like the hours of work. But because the average wage is so different, it made sense to split them. Here you can see I've got one maintenance foreman, this many hours, that much overtime, average wage, there's their budget, and so on and so on. 
Now, for those companies who do snow, and you may pay your employees a premium when they do snow, i.e. a higher wage, the way to compensate for that is to just break your snow hours out from your other hours. So for instance, my install form in here has 1800 hours in the summer, and then this 200 hours in the winter of snow equipment or snow plow operator at the higher wage. So if you do have employees who get paid a different wage, that's how to recover that. There's other smaller gaps like um, seasonal help, for instance, and that can easily be budgeted for as well. To add a seasonal laborer to my budget, I would just go new, seasonal help, we'll say part-time, maybe I need two part-time staff and they may only work 300 hours a season at an average wage of let's call it $13 an hour. And there you go. That's how I've budgeted for some part-time seasonal help during our peaks of the year. Now there is a tab here called salary field staff. It's really important to remember that's not for your overhead staff. Your overhead staff are going to be covered in a later video called overhead. This Salary field staff is strictly for foremen who you don't pay an hourly wage to, you pay a hard salary to. That's where you'd enter them in there. Now up here is a really important number. This is your field labor ratio. The number on the left is your ratio. The number on the right is the industry average. What does this mean? Well, that's the percent of my sales or my revenue that I end up giving to my crews and wages. In this case, it's saying 26.8%. And what that means is, of all the sales revenue we earn, and in this case, that's about a million dollars, we're going to spend about 26.8% or $268,000 on field wages. And then, of course, we got burden on top of that. The lower your field labor ratio, the more productive your staff are. The lower the ratio means your, your staff are generating more sales per dollar of wage than, in this case, the industry average. If your field labor ratio is higher than the industry average, it means your staff are not as productive as the average. And they're not generating as much sales for every hour they're working. The industry average is displayed over here on the right. So this is our rate ratio, and this is the industry average ratio, and I'd like to be lower than it. That indicates I'm productive. Also remember that different types of companies are gonna have very different labor ratios. A maintenance company, this ratio is going to be far higher than an install company. Why? Because an install company's sales have all kinds of materials built into them. So your labor is going to be a much smaller proportion. As a maintenance company, your field labor ratio is going to be a much higher portion. And that's why back on the budget info tab, we asked you for your work breakdown. That way, you can know what type of work you do and can provide realistic industry benchmarks for companies who do that specific mix of work. Let's take on a trickier question right now. Let's say you've got a field supervisor, you're a maintenance company, and you've got these guys out in the trucks that are driving around, they're meeting with clients, they're doing QA on jobs to make sure your jobs are in um, good shape. And uh, they're also running around supervising crews and making sure they're where they should be and doing the things they should be doing. So are they field labor or are they overhead? You need to ask yourself this question and make sure, absolutely sure, it's in the right area of your budget. But the easy answer is this. If you estimate these field supervisors in your estimate, so you think about their time when you're estimating, then they go in the field labor budget. If you don't think about their time, they go in overhead. I would bet that most companies would be the latter. When you build an estimate for your maintenance, most people are thinking about how much time it takes to cut the grass and to do the gardens and all the other things and not thinking about how much time it takes to supervise or not building that supervision time in their bid. But you could be on either end. Most companies would probably be overhead. And it doesn't matter which one it is. It's neither one is right as long as you're consistent. If you bid their time in the estimates, they are field labor. If you don't bid their time in estimates, they're overhead. And that applies for every single role in your company. If you have employees who do a bit of both, then put some of their hours in field labor and some of their hours in overhead so that the total matches their entire salary. Here's a quick couple of checks to make sure you get your field labor budget right. Number one, make sure it only includes your field staff. Again, this is staff whose time that you estimate. Number two, also make sure you're forecasting. If you've grown your sales budget by 20%, it's unlikely you're gonna be able to do that with the exact same crews you had last year. You are have to work more hours or possibly even hire more people. So make sure that you forecast changes into your field labor budget 
in a similar percentage that you forecast changing your sales. Number three, don't forget to include raises and changes. So if you're giving crews raises or you're hiring more people or you're letting people go, make sure those changes are in your budget as well. It's supposed to be a forecast, a prediction of where you're going to be at the end of the year. And finally, group your staff by type. As we showed you when we filled out the budget, don't put all your staff in individually. Group them by role and use an average wage for each role and your budget will be far simpler and easier to manage. Field labor budget is one of the trickier ones. So if you need some help, don't worry, you're in good company. Reach out to us on live chat. Check us out at goelement.com slash help or email us at advice.goelement.com. We're happy to give you a hand with any questions that you may have. It's so important that you get this budget right. Thanks for watching.